I think at, at this point, uh, we will begin with our first panel. This includes Dr. Sarah McKinnon from here at the University of Florida, Dr. Mark Mallory from Washington University of St. Louis, and Dr. Derek Petty from uh, IFPRI. Um, Dr. McKinnon. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here, being an organizer as well as a participant is a little bit intimidating and overwhelming, but um, it's nice to see so many faces in the audience. Um, I'll also say, because I am one of the organizers, if you're calling in, please keep your mic muted because we hear all the activity in the background. Um, so my intention with this talk is to really sort of lay the platform for the broader discussion into which we're going to delve over the next three or four hours and to begin, have been a, begin a conversation about these pathways that drive nutrition. And there's been, there's been significant discussion about agriculture and nutrition and the links between agriculture and nutrition, some of which seem very self-explanatory, but the outcomes are not necessarily as self-evident, um, meaning agriculture doesn't always lead to nutrition. And livestock is its own take on agriculture to nutrition. So we're gonna probe these pathways that have been well-documented in the literature and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like within the context of our work at the Livestock Innovation Lab. Um, I missed Glenn's beginning, beginning intro, so forgive me if this is redundant. But the way this all fits together is Ari and I came together, came to know each other within the context of the Livestock Innovation Lab, which is a group of very interdisciplinary um, scholars from across campus, scientists looking at this issue of how do we take a livestock system to improve nutrition globally, as Bola indicated. Um, but this, uh, and so the work here is somewhat uh, driven by the LISO activities, uh, but also moving towards what we're doing towards the end, or end of the symposium with the new Gates Foundation grant. So um, with that said, um, a, little bit of, a little bit of background. I, I mentioned, thank you. I mentioned about the Livestock Innovation Lab already. Um, I wanna say a few words as, that, as part of that foundation about why agriculture. So we know that Growth in the agricultural sector yields changes in nutrition that growth, economic growth in other sectors don't. Change. So we know that there is this link between agricultural production and changing the lives of these vulnerable populations globally. We also know that livestock holders, as opposed to non-livestock holders, are more apt to consume animal source food. So we, that's one of the pathways we'll talk about in a moment. We know that food and nutritional insecurity uh, food and nutritionally insecure households often are those who rely on agriculture. So despite the fact that agriculture is driving a, and as a solution for nutrition, it also is the livelihood of the most vulnerable and the most poor. So we have to better understand how to do it well in order to change the nutritional outcomes of the poor, because there are 155 million children under five globally who still suffer from chronic malnutrition. This framework I come back to all the time. This is the 1990 UNICEF framework for conceptualizing malnutrition. And though it's old hat at this point, I think it's really, uh, it's one of the early, early indicators of the complexity that we began to grapple with and understand of those underlying causes of malnutrition. So it was in this report in 1990 that you began to see um, the, the underlying causes and the basic causes. So how do we link poverty to nutritional outcomes? How do we link things like care practices. And one of, the, one of the major outcomes of this was the sense that you basically have three underlying causes of malnutrition. And for simplicity's sake, I'll call those food, care, and health. And those became the areas of focus as we began to try and unpack malnutrition. How do you affect it? So food is no longer sufficient, right? If care practices in the home are insufficient, or if there is um, a diversity of care practices based on the gender of a child within the household, you're going to see differential outcomes, even if food security of the household is stable. So intra-household dynamics, and then of course, health being not just access to health services uh, within the community, but also the, the hygiene and sanitation status of that household falls under that health um, pillar. So this is how we began to understand the complex drivers of malnutrition. And obviously agriculture plays an important role. Agriculture is the livelihood of people, so it affects even those basic causes, meaning what, are their in, how, what is their income level, how much access to resources do they have, and how, how can that affect care practices? So how often do they utilize health-seeking behaviors appropriately, going to clinic when they should, if you will? 
but it's it's continued to, to be complicated. And as we began to probe, as agriculture for nutrition began to be unpacked, which is really something that's happened a lot in the past 15 years, three pathways have emerged. And this has been well studied and well documented at this point. And we talk about production, income, and empowerment. And these three are typically looked at in um, in concert, but there are also scholars who work on nutrition that look at individual pathways. As we'll talk about in the second half of this conversation, the, that gets problematic because it's very hard to talk about production without talking about empowerment. It's very hard to talk about income without talking about production in these households because often livestock or, or crop production is the source of income. So what we're doing within the livestock lab is trying to take that growing body of literature and understand how nutrition income, I'm sorry, nutrition pathways um, from agriculture are different if you look at livestock, right? So this is my own version of that UNICEF model. And you can see at the top that you still have the, the um, food, care, and health. Those are those three um, uh, UNICEF underlying causes. But at the bottom, I have pushing into that, this livestock production system. And in that, you've got the three pathways that have been identified as affecting uh, nutrition from agriculture, and that is food production, income, and empowerment. And so how then do these pathways affect? What are the mechanisms by which they affect food, care, and health? And so it's complicated is the short answer, right? You, could, you think those squiggly lines are just squiggly lines. They're not. Those are, those are individual mechanisms by which production, increased live, livestock production may improve food security, right? So just to go through a few examples, this is not an exhaustive list, but from the literature, we know that, for example, food, uh, household food consumption of ASF foods is really important, as Bola mentioned earlier with the evidence from the Ionati study. None of us can really argue this anymore. ASF consumption is really important for young kids, right? The, it, the ASF contains, animal source foods contain amino acids and macronutrients in bioavailable um, packaging that, that works for the early development of children. Incomes to purchase enough food of nutritional quality. So cost, a lot of the research coming out of IFPRI right now, Bart Minton has done a lot of work on this in Ethiopia, cost as a barrier to ASF. So really trying to understand, even if people are producing something, where are the thresholds what, how much do they have to produce to get an income sufficient that they're going to either purchase other ASF or that they're going to keep some, what we call auto consumption, that they're going to consume some of the meat, eggs, uh, milk product that they produce. Resilience and livelihood of diversification in the face of climate change. We know that livestock is a diversification strategy for a lot of smallholder farmers. In the face of climate change, livestock can buffer those households from the shocks that do occur to crops where there's uh, crop harvest loss and other uh, negative uh, impact of climate change, diversification can into livestock can provide a buffer or increase the resilience of those households. That's another pathway, right? Another pathway by which food security is protected um, and it may increase incomes, may buffer uh, shocks so that care and feeding practices don't change. You don't go to skipping a meal or reducing uh, the quantity of food at a meal because of uh, in the content context of a crisis. And women's control over assets and income. This is an area that within my research lab we're looking a lot at in terms of empowerment, and but really trying to understand when women own the livestock or women control the outputs, whether that's byproducts of milk or eggs, how does that change? And the evidence is, is quite strong globally that where women control the animal assets and the decision-making, um, then, then you have changes in nutritional growth of kids within the household. And that's ownership and co-ownership as indicated in the 2014 study. So those are some of the ways we, that demonstrate that the agricultural pathways that improve nutrition, they do translate for livestock, right? They're valuable and they have traction, but there are also some risks. And so I've thrown in two additional lines here that are, that are the risk lines, right? And so we're only beginning to understand these pathways. And this is the bulk of the conversation today. It's really trying to probe into one of these, the first one, which is environmental enteric dysfunction and trying to understand whether this um, dysfunction of the gut, which you'll hear more about over the course of the morning, is really an underlying cause of a significant portion of malnutrition. And there is evidence 
that says that animal husbandry practices, particularly having livestock um, and particularly chickens in the home overnight is a risk factor for child stunting within the household. So there, and there are other risk factors as well, right? So one of them that I'm acutely aware of having most of my work has been with pastoralists in the Sahel, that there is an increased vulnerability among these livestock holders to, to shocks, to climate related shocks, because of the, um, the difference in terms of trade, caloric terms of trade between milk um, and grain. So uh, we can, I'm sorry, between ASF or meat, typically is what is looked at, um, and, and grain. But those terms of trade flip, so it very much favors pastoralists, which is why they're able to sustain livelihood. Um, small populations, mass amounts of meat are produced by pastoral populations, but with an environmental shock, like a, like a locust infestation or a drought, crop harvests fail, and what happens? The price of grain skyrockets, and the price of meat or milk or eggs plummets. So you can get nearly equal terms of trade, which is not survivable for those, those populations. So what can be a buffer for resilience in one context can also be a risk factor. So if you, if you begin thinking about these pathways, you begin to see that question, research questions emerge. And there are many more questions than I have answers for you today. But that's the first sort of conversation I want to put on the table. It's about these pathways and why are we talking about pathways for nutrition for livestock? That's how we get to this question of EEB. But there are also additional questions in terms of how do we maximize the benefits of livestock while minimizing the risks um, in terms of nutritional outcomes? And how do these pathways differ across contexts? So we can't just universally say, well, we want to look at empowerment and income and production in these 10 countries and compare them. Right, because empowerment in Nepal doesn't look like empowerment in Swaziland. Right? What production systems work and how they are embedded appropriately and efficiently, effectively for nutritional outcomes in one context doesn't equate necessarily to the other. Right? This idea of scale, what can you scale? Certainly there are technologies that scale, but can you use this model to understand the drivers of nutrition equally across spaces? And then what are the implications then for livestock research and development? So if I'm a social scientist on a team of livestock animal science experts, what is it that I need them to be answering so that I can ask and answer the right questions at the back end, which is often around consumption or household level. What decisions are being made? How are people making those decisions? And what are the nutritional outcomes? So I wanna talk for a few minutes about some of the research that we're now looking at um, uh, that tries to probe these pathways. And um, this is a map of the countries that LISL, the Livestock System Innovation Lab is working in. And it, within my lab, as part of my role on the Livestock Innovation Lab, we've been looking at these pathways. And we did a, we did a, a, um, a quasi-superficial um, pathway analysis of the countries that LISL was working in at that moment in time. So there were six at the, at the moment. And we really probed into three where there were significant differences. So we looked at, as Bola alluded to, we had these innovation platform meetings in all six LISL countries the first year of the grant. And that was an opportunity to talk to dozens of stakeholders about how livestock production systems worked in the spirit of understanding nutrition. And we got really different answers, right? And one of, one of the things that came out of a discussion in Niger was the idea of income. That, that income in Niger was, it, we kept hearing, that's the major barrier. You're not going to change behaviors in Niger because people don't have enough food to eat. And so until you get incomes below, above a certain threshold, you're not going to change the dynamic no matter what kind of behavior change strategy you implement. And other people in the room pushed back and said, no way. There are people who just don't know this, that if they sat and they heard Bola give his spiel on the value of animal source foods, that there's no mother in the world that wouldn't give her child that egg rather than sell it. So there was tension, even among stakeholders, about how, how do we respond? How do we change the dynamic on the ground? And so within our lab, we did a review of the literature to try and understand successes and failures and potential points of intervention for these pathways in these countries. So Niger, Nepal, and Ethiopia were the three that we looked at. And that's based on, so we did a review of the outcomes from this, the stakeholder meetings and country. Then we did the secondary literature and then we looked at a set of indicators that I won't, I, I'm not giving you all of it here, but we looked at indicators for income, indicators for production and indicators for 
um, Jesse, which is, or um, uh, women's empowerment, but also different aspects of social in inclusion. And what we found was that even within that superficial um, preliminary, let's say formative uh, review and, and research, very important differences arose, right? So when you looked in Niger, everything pointed towards income, that income was the major constraint. So if you think about those three pathways as arteries feeding for nutrition, that, that uh, the, the space in Niger that was most constrained was income, that the space that was most constrained in Ethiopia was production, and that the space in Nepal that was constrained was empowerment um, or social inclusion. So not just women, the caste system in Nepal really complicates how we look at empowerment there. And so I'm going to give you this sort of nutshell version of what we, what we found in looking at that by country. So in Niger, widespread severe poverty, large livestock sector, including pastoral populations. This is the nature of why income is constraining livestock production for nutrition, right? Water arose as a major limiting resource. So people's inability to produce income was constrained by water. So water kept coming up as a cross-cutting theme uh, within the context of Niger. And climate change, again, this idea of shifting terms of trade against livestock holders, where um, typically it favors them in terms of poor terms of trade during climate crisis. And in a place like Niger, climate crisis is no longer a decadal event. The periodicity of those events is now quite short. Every two to three years, there's a new crisis in Niger. Um, so, that's, that was the, the context of that major constraint in, in Niger on production, I'm sorry, on um, livestock as a mechanism for nutrition. In Ethiopia, it was quite different, right? So it was production, limited production of livestock is what was constraining nutrition directly. Interestingly, when you unpack that, it was very clear that you can't, this is my earlier point, you can't really just look at one pathway because production in Ethiopia, if you unpack it, is also about incomes, right? So you've got within production, you've got production for auto consumption and then production for income. And there are constraints on both fronts, but it's really the latter um, that ar arises in the literature as the barrier. So auto consumption is strained by cultural norms. Uh, we have a paper under, under review right now really looking at um, barriers to ASF consumption. The cultural norms and constraints, particularly on women and children, are, are massive, but it's complicated by the context of Ethiopia, the uh, Orthodox Christian population, the tradition of fasting, all of that contributes to the context of um, taboos around and cultural norms for ASF consumption. And livelihood and income is constrained by animal health production management systems. So looking at how can we improve the health of animals in order to produce, improve productivity of each animal, animal management. Um, and, and livestock policy, which will come up again later on. And then in Nepal, it was quite different. So in Nepal, it was really this idea of empowerment and how in, in gender studies, we talk about intersectionality and how gender issues intersect with things like socioeconomic status, caste, and other uh, social, um, social stratifications. So geography, age, ethnicity, all of these things changed the way people had access to livestock production, so different castes in Nepal can produce different types of animals. If certain castes produce certain livestock, then other castes can or cannot consume or touch those. So there's, there's all sorts of constraints within the social system that foster or limit um, ASF, uh, not just ASF consumption, but as uh, nutrition as an, end, as an end goal. So all of that is to say that looking at these three countries, in a pathway analysis. Three different pathways arose as the sort of major constrained pathway. And yet when you probe that and you go into why, the nuance of why in each place, it's not to say that, that gender and empowerment is not going to be an issue in Ethiopia. Undoubtedly it is, but it's certainly not gonna look like it does in Nepal, right? So when you do these path and pathway analyses, they have to be context specific and country level is not sufficient either, right? Our work in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is not Ethiopia. You really have to understand what, what's happening in that district. What are the cultural norms and traditions in that area? So scale is a major constraint. When you take a research paradigm and design like the pathways for nutrition, it doesn't all, it, do, it doesn't all fall nicely into place. It's complicated. So in closing, um, just a few, a few takeaways in bullet points are the sort of 
the statements that I want to leave you with. And then the, the sub bullets are the research questions I left from each statement, right? So livestock is an opportunity for us to improve nutrition. But what role, what is the role of livestock excreta on human health and nutrition, right? So it's great to say livestock are a mechanism to improve nutrition. But are we also, are we increasing the risk at the same time that we're trying to present a solution? ASF plays an important role in proper child development and nutrition, no doubt. But what about the cost, right? So how does, how does consumption at the household versus sale um, get determined? And what is the price point at which someone says, you know what, it's, it's worth enough to me internal to my household that I'm, I'm going to keep a little bit. I'm not going to sell it. Where are those points? So that, as a social scientist, is very interesting to me. How much of global malnutrition is actually driven by ASF cost? The cost barriers, is that actually what's, what's limiting ASF consumption, or is it education and knowledge? And behavior change remains a major barrier to improving health. No doubt, behavior change is one of the hardest things out there in science to do. Um, but how can we identify the communities where behavior change is sufficient? And once we've identified them, then we know we have the tools through Spring and other programs to take those in. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Mark Menard. Well, certainly thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm a pediatrician. I uh, am paid by Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, but I physically work in Africa. I've been working there 33 years. Um, and probably the thing that people tell me is most distinctive about what I do is I can play across the whole spectrum. So in other words, um, with basic science, I can sit down and talk about sequencing and microbiology. And on the other hand, I'm one of five experts that sets the policy for WH nutrition. But I enter the system as a clinician who wants to make people's lives better. So I've been asked to talk about um, a cause of stunning called environmental and enteric dysfunction. So let me have you take a look here. Stunting is core growth and development, okay? It's development on a, in lots of different parts of the body. In order for to get good growth and development, you need to have three pillars. Like a three-legged stool, one of them is bad, the other two can't make up for that. And those three pillars are an adequate intake of nutrients in your diet, a exposure, limited exposure to infectious insults. You can be infected all the time and expect to grow and develop. And then the third pillar is gut health, which sounds like, you know, one of the fancy words, which is what I would talk about here. Um, so if we think about something in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's where I've spent, I would say, you know, 90% of my time and effort on just a few projects in India. Um, it, it occurs, if we want to think about when it occurs in the life cycle, these distinctly point to different sort of causes and etiologies. The third it occurs before you're born. And if you want to make a generalization, that's about inflammation during pregnancy of the mother. Um, studies have uh, shown that food supplementation of mothers has very little impact. It doesn't mean mothers are pregnant women don't need to eat, you don't need to eat a healthy diet, but that alone is not going to give you um, uh, a baby with normal growth and development. About half of this uh, retardation growth and development, half a study, occurs between say six and 12 months or so. And this is a vulnerable time. I mean, the poorer place you are, the more adequate and wonderful breastfeeding is. So this is, breastfeeding is great food and it's usually totally adequate for the first six months of life. So typically in Africa, we see, you know, some children are born stunted, then everybody grows great for the first six months, and then you see growth falter. Some pictures of that. Um, and that's about what children get to eat in addition to breast milk, because at six months of age or so, breast milk is not enough. And then the remaining, you know, as the children get older and older, and I mean back from the six months, 12 months, 18 months, that's when gut health begins to play a prominent role. Um, so if you you know, say, what's the deal with stunting? Like, you know, you know, some economists here today, you're going to earn 22% less money in your life. Your life expectancy is going to be 
17% less. I mean, it's a huge cost to society. And that's why it's enemy number one on the sustainable development goals. And I was misreading the slides because that was the one I just told you about why we're all stunted costs. So I'm going to move on then to environmental and terror dysfunction. Something that occurs, a chronic inflammatory condition that occurs in the uh, first uh, three years of life. I'll show you some histology pictures of it. And we, we can say you shouldn't think of it as a disease or being caused by a microbe or a nutritional deficiency. Like stunting, you should see it as, as, the re, as an organ system's reflection of, a, of a, uh, an insulting environment. So here's a picture just about the ages when we have, I mean, on the uh, y-axis, we've got a, a common test for ED, which is lactulose excretion. And you can see that you know, after about a year of life, that in a, in a population of rural African kids is, uh, is increasing. It's a, something you have at a point in time. So you don't have to have it all the time. It's not an acquired condition like that, 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 that you just keep all the time. So when you measure it on a certain day, and you can say that's something about the gut health that day, but not, not that's not something about the gut health over the last six months. This cartoon here, I think, is the best way I can give you a clue about what this is. So, normal gut epithelium, beautiful um, mucus layer, preventing direct access to the surface to microbes. Nutrients flow through the mucus layer, and there's all kinds of, of protective immunological cells here. What we see out in environmental enteric dysfunction is there's a breakdown of the mucus layer. Lots of pathogens as well as commensal bacteria are, are busy damaging the gut epithelium. And then there's lots of immunological reaction, the systemic inflammation, if you will. Um, and this is a, a microscopic picture of the same thing. So, what's happening is the ability to absorb nutrients goes down because of the surface areas, a lot less there. Uh, all this inflammation costs energy. And, and, and shifts the hormonal balance to away from growth and development toward fighting infection. Uh, it's a, not a condition that anybody, you can tell by examining people or doing a survey. A survey is something you can measure their height, you know, or rather measure seven hundred kids' heights and get a sense of something in that community. There's no way to tell by looking at somebody or a simple examination whether they're, what their gut looks like. Those pictures obviously were taken with, with a, an endoscope, something like that. It's very um, specialized in something not specific. So we have a surrogate, a bronze standard, if you will. We can talk a lot about what shortcomings and advantages are, but it's a sugar absorption test. So this is where children drink a sugar solution. This is a sugar that's not metabolized, a sugar that's a disaccharide. We don't have an enzyme for feeding. And so when it leaks in through, through holes, then um, that's abnormal. And the more leaks in, the more uh, abnormal your gut is. So this is the uh, most common variant is called lactose mannitol test. And sometimes, well, most uh, times mannitols included. <coughs> the, the rationale is offered as a, a, a normalizing factor uh, because it may normalize for intestinal transit time or gut surface area. And so these are just epithelial cells on a cartoon. And normally cell junctions are, are <clears throat> controlled or established by these sort of loop-like pieces of rope proteins, which pull the cells together. Um, and this is a, a poor pathway, a weak pathway. And poor pathways um, are about five angstroms and a disaccharide will pass through that. And uh, we consider that the most normal or healthy kind of pathway. This is something that happens in response to cytokines. You know, so it's, it has some kind of physiologic function for these pathways to open up a little bit to maybe 15 or 50 angstroms or so. And, uh, and somehow that, I mean, that helps the host uh, deal with the, the insults coming from the gut. And 
but then you can just cut these look these proteins and that gives you an unrestricted pathway and that's a bad thing because then microbes can can access the systemic circulation um directly so that's another model or, or way to think about what ed is disrupted cell junctions too many too many of, of these have opened up to become these and too many of these have become separate to become uh, these down here so um we have done many tens of thousands of these sugar absorption tests over my career and uh in our uh just as a side it's a te technical point that probably isn't very appropriate to this audience but rather than think of these traditionally reported as ratios but there's no um no good rationale for that and, and if you just look at the lactulose absorption you'll find that that correlates better with growth and, and damage and health of the gut so some uh, biological perturbations that we see going on in these guts uh, we have done whole transcriptomes on several hundred kids in this area and you can see these pathways are all about inflammation and about mucus synthesis and development and cell adhesion. Um, the host response is, can be a chronic inflammation and a compromised mucus layer, compromised cell uh, adhesion. I just throw this paper out from science last year. So, because if we're thinking about this, you know, right now you're thinking of these microbes and they're doing all this damage and they're causing all this inflammation. Well, these, these mice were exposed at a very young age to some salmonella. They cleared that infection, and no evidence of that infection, but repeated exposure, and not too many times repeated, resulted in these villi being coated with protein that promotes shorter cell life, shorter villi length, and uh, apoptosis. Um, so there might be something in the immature immune system that if you repeatedly stimulate it early on, you set up a chronic inflammatory state, you might be to break that cycle. Um, what this slide is meant to show you is that this is uh, more enteropathy, <coughs> severe, and these are change in height for HZ score. And you can see that the more you have, now you're losing weight, losing height, compared to the other population. And if you do some kinds of mathematical modeling, the one of the biggest contributors to this is your gut health, more so than your diet diversity or your consumption of animal-based foods or household food security. It's a clue that, that this is a player now uh, that we should pay attention to. Kind of making the same point, the greater your lactulose excretion is, the less you grow tall. And this is something from Gambia back in the early 90s that, that verifies basically the, the same thing. This is some data that our group came up with in the last five years or so. So uh, the relationship looks like this between better growth and gut, worse gut health. So <clears throat> there have been uh, a number of intervention trials to heal this. People, um, when we don't know a lot about something, sometimes people will, will grasp pretty quickly for, for their own opinions about what it is, but just a caution, it's kind of a complex thing, biology. And uh, <laughs> and because of that, I would have to declare myself to be an empiricist. So I mean, I believe we, we can't really understand biology well enough to be able to devise solutions, but we try things. And if they work, we should keep trying more of them and modifications thereof. And if they don't, we should turn around and walk the other way. Um, so probiotic, these, these trials I'm describing here, all were done in a highly controlled situation. So in other words, there's no question that the individuals got this intervention. Somebody gave them, gave it to them every day. Um, it's not meant to be a practice, how it was something to be a rolled out in implementation and practicality, but it's meant to say, what does lactobacillus GG, um, will this do have a healing of the gut? And uh, a non-absorbable antibiotic, you, think you might think you need to uh, 
similarities between this condition and something called small bowel bacterial overgrowth in general. The, the upper small bowel, which I was showing you these cartoons of earlier, is doesn't have that many microbes. Uh, it's pretty clean. Um, that it showed absolutely no effect on the, which one I call ED, which I'm going to call the surrogate for that, is lactulose uh, excretion. So more lactulose excretion is worse. Um, now, just in quick terms of numbers, a normal lactulose excretion will say is less than 0.2%, and a very abnormal one is greater than 0.45. So these show really no effect. Deworming, which is a very acceptable, safe, widespread practice, or using zinc uh, as a treatment for diarrhea. Uh, these got us about a third of the way there uh, on healing the enteropathy. So they just thought that they had no effect. And this, this theme of, of going part of the distance would be you know, exactly the theme of scientific interventions all over the world. I mean, there, there isn't anything that, that, that's gonna fix it. And uh, it's going to be a set of interventions. Interesting, and perhaps disappointing, was that the effect wasn't added. So when you give them together, you still get a third, third of the healing going on. You don't get, you don't get two thirds or half. Uh, a prebiotic or resistant starch type two didn't do anything, nor did PUFA supplementation. Now, uh, complementary feeding with legumes, particularly common beans and cowpeas, and we chose varieties on legumes on two bases. One of them was the fact that these have 25% protein, and we think protein is the key um, nutrient in tightest economy in that six to 10 month old age group when half of that something is occurring. Uh, so that's one thing. And then also they have 25% fiber. So we screen different varieties of cowpea and common bee, trying to, pro to promote uh, uh, a, uh, an anti-inflammatory uh, profile in, uh, in animal model. And we saw there about a de decrease in something of about 0.15%, uh, excuse me, 0.15 Z scores, which is again, uh, I mean, people would say 0.3 or so would be an effect worse than something. So about halfway there. And this is um, the same effect. I mean, I think that, that it's interesting to talk about the eggs and especially because they're gonna do a chicken project in Ethiopia. But if we shut the door and be a little bit sober, we're never gonna see that kind of hit again never seen that on stunting, giving eggs, giving you 0.6 Z scores of increase. Um, and, uh, and I know the investigator, she works uh, at WashU very well. And so they're perhaps the one way Africans are, are ameliorating this hit is they're, they're very good at breastfeeding and breastfeeding ad lib uh, early on, which probably has a health protective effect. And then administration of life likes to design a lot of care and sure. Protein that's in uh, milk in high quantities and lysozyme and breast milk in high quantities. And we used a lysozyme that was made uh, in rice, a genetically modified rice, to, to produce this exogenous protein. And again, there we got about a third of, of the gut health being healed with, with that kind of protein. And so, uh, likewise with the uh, common bean and cowpea. So, What's been done in terms of trials, I think, is that um, some things work part way. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's see what we got to finish up here. I wanted to mention a couple of a very uh, extensive studies that are very important. One's called Wash Benefits, one's called Shine. These were huge interventional efforts. I mean, with six over 6,000 participants at each of the three sites. I mean, if you think about it, I'm not going to say it so much, but they focused on de delivering good water quality, sanitation, which is a code word for how you dispose of your stool, hand washing practices, and gave children a food supplement. And they mixed those up so they put them together in different combinations. And the bottom line in wash benefits and in Africa was that diarrhea was the primary outcome there, as well as growth. Um, <laughs> None of these things did anything to reduce diarrhea or improve growth except giving children food. 
Okay, so, and that effect of that food was again about about point. Uh, I think in ten in ten years about 0.15 z scores in Bangladesh was about 0.19 z scores. So, and then the effect was also seen in, in the Shine study in Zimbabwe as well. So that is um, that, and I give some growth. I've told you a little bit about. I like this picture because it's telling you at six months of age, everybody begins growth faltering. This is their change in their in their life, uh, and whereas common cowpea had less growth faltering, it's not a, you know there's still plenty of other room in this gap. For, for us to add interventions and make it a lot better for these kids. And also, this is another measure of growth, weight for height. So you can see that among the population who has, I just keep saying this over and over because I just keep hearing it for decades now, it's about breastfeeding. It's not, it's not about breastfeeding at all. It's about what you're feeding after, in addition to breastfeeding at um, six to 15 months. And then a couple of said we've defined, seen some signatures, microbiotic signatures related to good gut health. And uh, we're supposed to look at these bar graphs over here. You see children at 12 months of age or older and beginning to develop bad gut health, that children with, with good gut health have different profiles than this one. Whereas the, um, I think that's all that I said. I hope we finished in time. <laughs> but uh, thanks to the organizers. Third speaker in this uh, panel is Dr. Derek Kuhn. Good morning, everyone. I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I've got a wife who's heavily pregnant. It's a few weeks left to go, so um, I'm going to stay put. Um, and I'm going to talk today about animal source foods in child stunting. This is a recent IFPRI discussion paper with John Hodenot and Ali Hidvon. So this is superfluous. We've already been told why we care about stunting. I'll skip this, but I do want to emphasize again that most stunting manifests in the first thousand days of life, um, especially over the uh, six to 24 month age range. So there's this question, of course, why do kids start to fall behind um, so prominently at around six months? Obviously, one explanation is poor diets, uh, rapidly increasing nutrient requirements in this age group. As the previous speaker said, um, those requirements are no longer uh, can no longer only be met by breast milk. Um, and then, this within diets, you might focus on poor feeding frequency, not feeding children um, frequently enough. Um, and it, you know, there's a small stomach problem for children. I think that's something at least economists uh, don't think enough about having you know, spent several decades analyzing household diets rather than child feeding um, issues. So there's sort of a basic small stomach problem. So you need um, very nutrient dense foods um, for these small stomachs and the, the children need to be fed frequently. Um, and of course the nutrient density is, is one of the functions that we hope is achieved by having a very diversified diet. And of course, the previous speaker talked quite a bit about infection. Um, these infants have weak immune systems, highly, highly vulnerable to increased exposure to pathogens, diarrhea, AED, et cetera. So I don't need to go into that. I think what's somewhat surprising is that dietary determinants of stunting are somewhat neglected. Um, diets are obviously a little bit elusive. Um, individual, usual diets, even what people normally eat on a weekly basis are um, quite hard to measure. And I think you know many um, surveys have sort of moved uh, away from one type of error and tried to you know, minimize recall bias, but a 24 hour recall is, is not ideal really. Um, diets are hard to experiment on. Um, there's surprisingly little um, evidence in LDCs, especially from experimental evidence. Um, and of course the diet as a whole is really hard to, um, to change, um, although it's maybe a little bit easier for young children. Um, household surveys have been used to link dietary diversity indicators to stunting, um, but these associations actually have tended not to be robust, um, and I'll talk about some methodological reasons for that. Um, but there's also reasons to think theoretically that um, for child growth, diversifying into animal source foods may be especially crucial. Uh, since 1974, this sort of protein deficiency idea um, concerns have largely been sidelined. Uh, prior to that, in the 50s and 60s, people talked about protein deficiency a lot. But an influential uh, 1974 Lancet article um, sort of said, yeah, 
calories are probably more like the, the limiting factor. Um, and that kind of argument didn't think much about protein quality. Um, yet yeah, animal source food proteins contain essential amino acids that um, can't be synthesized within the body. And uh, they appear to play a seminal role in programming um, growth and other uh, and cognitive development and so on. And animal source foods are also dense in a wide range of micronutrients, um, as well as, of course, in, in calories and fats. Um, so they're, they're just nutrient dense in general. I think it's fair to say that multiple animal source foods are always preferable. Um, for example, dairy is rich in calcium, and uh, you know, calcium deficiency is, is most easily closed by increasing um, dairy consumption, but it doesn't have iron. Um, so you'd want to mix dairy with flesh foods or eggs, uh, etc. So the empirical evidence linking animal source foods to child growth is varied. It comes from different literature. Um, there's a handful of ASF interventions um, that do find sizable growth impacts. Um, there's a lot of nutrition sensitive livestock interventions out there. They also sometimes show signs of impact, um, but there's several problems there, small sample sizes, et cetera. Um, and they typically also use behavioral interventions. So we also might want to know the um, nutritional impacts of uh, quote unquote pure livestock interventions rather than um, interventions that also are trying to improve child feeding um, patterns, et cetera. And then there's a series of observational studies that link growth to livestock ownership. Um, actually, almost all of those are in East Africa. Um, a lot pertain to um, dairy. Um, there's just a few outside of East Africa. And then there's historical studies by mostly economic historians that link adult heights to animal source food consumption patterns. So these are looking at long-term secular trends in adult heights and saying, okay, well, there's an expansion in dairy consumption in the Netherlands after World War II, et cetera. Um, there's uh, also fairly weak evidence on the constraints to animal source food consumption among children. Um, there's a lot of economic studies that focus on constraints like low income, high prices, et cetera. Um, but they tend to focus on household um, consumption indicators from economic surveys. There's sociological studies um, that focus on cultural constraints. So you know, a few of those looking at um, low levels of egg consumption in Africa, vegetarianism in India, and so on. And then there's nutrition interventions um, that sort of assume knowledge is the major constraint. You know, the behavioral change interventions um, are assuming that at least one of the factors that limits um, uh, improved feeding practices is poor um, knowledge, nutritional knowledge among parents. So the research questions in this paper are threefold um, or three objectives. The first is just to describe animal source food consumption patterns. We use a huge um, data set, uh, DHS demographic health survey data, um, many more households and kids, but we're going to focus on about, about 112,000 children aged 6 to 23 months from 46 developing countries. And one of the ideas there is that um, you really need large samples to um, look at the links between diets and stunting because you really need to narrow the age range quite a bit. Uh, then we're going to use that data to look at the links, the associations between animal source foods and stunting. Um, so we can't interpret these as causal, but we do try to sort of minimize the bias by saturating the models with a range of control variables. Um, and unlike the previous literature, we're going to go beyond aggregate dietary diversity metrics, sort of the DDS dietary diversity scores, um, to look at animal source foods first and other foods, and then some even some specific food groups um, and see whether we, we see the expected associations between animal source foods and stunting. And then lastly, we're going to touch on constraints to animal source food consumption. We're going to look at price, wealth, and knowledge constraints to a certain extent um, uh, to document the main factors driving ASF consumption patterns in poor countries. So all our data on um, stunting and diets comes from the DHS, DHS rounds between 2006 and 2014 when the dietary model, module was fairly standardized. Um, so mothers were asked, uh, primarily mothers, um, asked which of 12 food groups their youngest child consumed in the past 24 hours. And this is a table sort of showing the schematic of different food groups. So what's uh, commonly done is the seven food groups in bold on the left-hand side. And they're usually used either to make a dietary diversity score out of seven or uh, minimum dietary diversity, which is four out of um, seven food groups. 
but we're also going to define an ASF indicator, just an animal source food dummy, um, if they consume, if a child consumed dairy, eggs, or flesh foods in the past 24 hours. Um, and then we're going to use some of the disaggregated groups on the right hand side. So cows, milk, eggs, um, red or white meat, fish, et cetera. I'm going to look at non animal source foods as well when we do that. Obviously. Our main dependent variable is stunting, uh, stunting uh, height for age, scores of less than minus two. And then to look at constraints, we're also going to bring in a measure from another paper um, I've been working on for some time where we construct um, national level calorie price ratios um, from the uh, 2011 International Comparison Program data um, from the World Bank. And uh, I can you know, talk about that more in detail, but uh, the basic gist is that we have national level prices for a lot of different foods for 177 countries um, with some gaps. And we're going to convert those food prices into price per calorie. And then we're going to take the ratio um, of the calorie of um, the cheapest food, uh, sorry, we're given food in a country. So the cheapest white meat, for example, or the cheapest um, egg relative to the cheapest staple cereal in each country. So these are going to be ratios. Um, so we're going to be able to say egg calories are five times as expensive as um, rice calories in India, for example. Um, I'm just showing you a few of the food groups here. There are the, um, the cereals is the base. We have 13 types of cereals in the data. Um, and then we have the following animal source food, cow's milk fresh, cow's milk long life, uh, meat fresh, um, sorry, red meat fresh, uh, chicken eggs fresh, and um, fish fresh. Actually, sorry, uh, meat fresh includes uh, white and red meat here. It's aggregated. Um, and then methods, we're going to just show you some unweighted consumption patterns by child age, some graphical evidence, sort of nonlinear, uh, flexible L polygraphs of stunting by age and animal source food consumption by age. Um, we're going to look at stunting by age for samples of children that did and did not consume animal source foods in the past 24 hours. We're going to use multiple multivariate regressions. We're going to pool across countries to keep large samples. Um, but use survey fixed effects, meaning we're focusing on within country um, uh, associations. And we're going to saturate these models with a lot of control variables, potential confounding factors that could be driving stunting as well, such as household wealth, parental education, access to health services, wash, et cetera. And then something we're really going to focus on is age disaggregation. Um, obviously, stunting is a cumulative measure, so the benefits of improved diets won't be instantaneous. So using kids who are six months old, for example, is not very sensible um, because they haven't yet benefited from improved complementary foods. Um, so we would expect larger effects for older kids under the assumption that the diets, the, the, the foods they were eating yesterday are foods that they have regularly eaten for the past 12 months or so. Um, and we're also going to do a dietary disaggregation by splitting the sample into kids achieving or not achieving minimum dietary diversity. So we wanted to see whether animal source food consumption was in some sense driving this relationship between minimum dietary diversity, but also whether animal source foods were um, had a significant association with stunting, even for kids with otherwise poor diets. In other words, we were trying to get at this idea of should we actually not only be emphasizing um, improving dietary diversity, but particularly emphasizing animal source food. Lots of problems, I'll skip over those, emitted variable bias, attenuation bias, et cetera. So turning to the results, these are animal source food consumption patterns. Um, the expected patterns stunting very high in Africa and South Asia, um, but those are also regions where you have very poor dietary diversity. Um, for example, in Africa, under 17% of children 6 to 23 months achieved minimum dietary diversity. Um, animal source food consumption is also um, low in those regions. So in Latin America, North Africa, and Western Asia, these more middle-income countries, um, at least three-quarters of children consumed an animal source food um, yesterday. Um, whereas once you turn to sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, it's about half. Um, so that's really quite low, uh, given that you know, any animal source food such as dairy could count there. Um, the last two columns split the sample um, by MDD equals zero and MDD equals one. And you'll see that actually, even among the MDD equals zero group, the kids with inadequate diets by that definition of four food groups, um, quite a lot of kids do consume animal source foods in there. So that gives a lot of variation. 
But once you move to MDD equals one, that threshold of four food groups was basically picked so as to ensure at least um, one animal source food. Um, turning to more detailed um, dietary patterns by region, um, there's some really stark and very interesting patterns here. I think what's most striking is that you know, Latin America and Caribbean, kind of Western Hemisphere, and to some extent North Africa and West Asia, we sort of see patterns that we think are probably pretty similar to um, diets in high-income countries where dairy is really prominent. So, you know, about 60% of kids in those group regions consume dairy. Um, but once you get to um, South Asia, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, dairy consumption is really low. And we know that in many parts of Africa, dairy is not a traditional food. Um, you know, there's problems in dairy production, such as setsi fly. Um, so that's really striking. Egg consumption, um, again, fairly high in Latin America, moderately low in um, North Africa, but then really low in um, South Asia, very low in India, um, and then low again in Sub-Saharan Africa, just 12% um, of kids um, consuming eggs in West and Central Africa, for example. Similar sorts of pattern with meat, but meat is a little bit, uh, meat and fish is a little bit higher. And what's really striking, I think, is that fish is a really important animal source food in Western and Central Africa, and even in much of Eastern and Southern Africa, not all, but many areas. So fish, in fact, is the most common animal source food um, in Western and Central Africa by some distance. To meet the, re the regressions here, we've um, split the sample into all kids in regressions one to four, and then, um, kids uh, not achieving minimum dietary diversity. And so we see what we expect. When we switch to older kids, so regressions three and four, um, kids 18 to 20 and 21 to 23 months, um, you see that consuming any animal source food yesterday is associated with almost a four point reduction in stunting. Um, and what's quite striking is that even when you switch to kids who don't achieve minimum dietary diversity, that relationship basically holds. So um, there's benefits to you know, consuming animal source foods, even for kids with otherwise um, deficient diets. So we thought that was quite a striking result. In other results not shown here, we also show that um, there are larger returns, much larger returns to consuming two animal source foods than there are to, to consuming one animal source food. Other um, uh, foods are in these regressions and the most striking association is that fruits also have significant associations with stunting, of course they're um, micronutrient dense and also very palatable for, for young children. Here we're looking at regressions of stunting against individual animal source foods. Um, in some regressions we split up meat and fish, but here meat and fish are aggregated. And we tend to see when you again start looking at the older children, um, these uh, negative associations for dairy, um, you know, quite robust and also meat and fish and a little bit of an impact um, or association in regression four for eggs. Um, but we tend to find eggs, um, you know, have a, have a fairly weak association, and that may be because it measurement error is more important. You know, eggs are consumed less frequently, um, or it could be other factors going on, such as this, you know, well-known problem of uh, uh, chickens uh, uh, potentially causing contamination of, of the homestead environment. Again, uh, not shown here, but we find that um, fruits have significant associations, and we split results by regions, and the results are, as you'd expect, heterogeneous, but um, generally, in, in, in pretty much every region, um, you'll find at least one animal source food is significant, um, sometimes multiple. So, tending to constraints, um, yeah, there's a lot of obviously poor countries are poor and income is a basic constraint. But um, in, in another paper, um, what I looked at is um, how costly different um, foods are relative to staple series. And in other words, how costly is it to diversify away from starchy staples? And that you know will depend a lot, um, sort of economics as a, as a law of one price, and that, that says that you know. Um, if, if, a, if a food is highly tradable, its price should be similar across countries. And that's sort of what we see for roots and tubers and to some extent legumes, which are quite internationally tradable. But once we start moving towards more perishable animal source foods, you would think that local food prices are much more determined by local productivity, uh, which is going to be low in poor countries. And that's what you see. So cow's milk, um, you know, much more expensive um, in developing countries. And in Africa, where, you know, there's only a few countries where they have a tradition of um, owning, you know, lots of cows and producing lots of milk, um, 
in other countries you don't see that and fresh milk is extremely expensive processed milk is tradable dairy powder is uh, tradable so you don't see such big price differentials um, although you also don't see very high consumption of processed milk in much of Africa. And then eggs are very, you know, highly um, non-tradable um, food, at least non-tradable over long distances. Again, you see the same thing, you know, quite expensive in South Asia, very expensive in Africa. Many countries, eggs are 10 times um, as expensive a source of calories compared to uh, stable cereals. Meat and fish tend to be more tradable. You can transport live animals. You can dry meat and fish. Um, uh, frozen uh, meat and fish is also becoming more tradable in developing countries. And you see that they are quite affordable. And I think what's really striking here is that fish is quite affordable in Africa. And that explains the relatively high consumption patterns. So in Western Central Africa, where we said our fish was the most important animal source food, it's just five times as expensive uh, as uh, staple cereals. And then an alternative to um, animal source foods, which I didn't mention much, are fortified baby cereals, but they are very expensive in um, developing countries. There's a whole series of issues um, surrounding those. Well, these are just the results from some regressions um, where we regress child consumption patterns against a range of um, child, household, community level factors, and then some national level factors. So, you know, these are very much associations, not difference in difference or anything. But we wanted to see, in particular, how strongly prices, these um, calorie relative prices, how strongly they're associated with consumption. And for eggs, for example, it, the results suggest that halving the relative egg price, say going from 10 in Burkina Faso to 5 in Bangladesh, halving that relative egg price would predict a 15-point increase in egg consumption among young kids. So low productivity and high prices seem to be um, a major constraint. And we pretty much see that across the board. This is dairy, um, also very strong price associations for dairy. Um, similar story again for meat. Uh, the relationship is a bit weaker for fish, um, uh, so that's a somewhat interesting story, but it's also a little bit more measurement error in fish. But basically, across the board, um, prices, high prices look like a major constraint. So poor people face a double economic burden. They're poor by definition, but they also live in economies that supply animal source foods at very high prices. Uh, why are nutrient-rich foods so expensive? Well, many of them are highly perishable. Eggs and, and fresh milk are the extreme, and that makes them difficult to trade long distances. Um, so you can't really use imports um, to drive down the price of animal source foods that are highly perishable. Um, that's basically what I said. Limited trade means relative prices are largely set by local productivity levels, which are low. Um, particularly poultry is a good example. Productivity is very low in poor countries. Um, Backyard poultry is very widespread. Chickens are the most widely owned livestock, um, but children in those households barely eat eggs um, or meat for that matter. Um, and what we tend to see is that egg prices are lower when poultry is commercialized. It's a sector that really benefits from economies of scale. Um, this is a graph just showing these relative egg prices on the y-axis against the share of chickens in intensive commercialized systems on the right-hand axis from a paper by Gilbert et al. in PLOS One. And you see what a very strong relationship um, there is across countries. Um, the R squared here is 0.6. So these, um, these, the share of chickens in intensive systems explains 60% of the variation in egg prices across, across countries, um, a strong linear fit. And, and in fact, that relationship holds when you control for GDP and urbanization. And in contrast, across countries at least, there's a negative link between um, egg consumption and um, chicken ownership. You know, it's really the, the, the kids who are living in economies with low egg prices, they're the ones who um, consume more eggs. Uh, owning chickens has, you know, a moderate effect um, uh, and many, uh, uh, no effect across countries and then a moderate effect even within countries. So in Burkina Faso, for example, 90% of rural households own chickens and something like 2% of kids ate eggs yesterday. Um, so, you know, just giving, giving, giving people chickens is not the solution. So last slide, um, nutritionists have long emphasized important nutrient properties of animal source foods, including a renewed um, emphasis on protein quality. Um, there's only limited evidence linking animal source food consumption to improved growth outcomes. Um, and there's not much work um, exploring constraints to animal source food consumption, particularly among kids. So in this paper, we've made some contribution. We think um, animal source food consumption is still very low in Africa and Asia, only about 50% of kids you know, seem to consume um, animal source foods on a daily basis. 
We also note striking animal source food consumption patterns. Fish, for example, very important in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and dairy is less important there. And we find that animal source food consumption is strongly associated with linear growth. Consuming a diverse array of animal source foods um, also seems more beneficial than any single uh, animal source food. Uh, we show that animal source foods are very expensive relative to cereals, and that's especially true, as you would expect, for fresh milk and eggs. Um, fish and meat are relatively cheap in some places. And there are multiple constraints to animal source food consumption. I think our contribution is to show that high prices are a huge constraint, uh, basically for all animal source foods, but wealth is also a constraint, and some of the other factors you would expect are there, um, such as poor uh, parental knowledge. Um, policy implications, obviously we still need to focus on dietary diversification, stunting isn't everything, um, but we do need to ensure that um, dietary diversification um, efforts have a strong emphasis on animal source foods, ideally including multiple animal source foods. Um, knowledge constraints may still be important, but it's really critical to use production, value chain and trade policies to reduce animal source food prices at the economy-wide level. I think many nutrition sensitive interventions have been a little bit too small, too local. And we need to think big about how to you know, reduce the price of eggs, say, in the next 10 to 20 years. We obviously need to factor in environmental implications. There are vast differences in uh, greenhouse gas emissions from different types of animal source food consumption. And we need to factor in the human health externalities uh, raised earlier. Um, livestock production has zoonotic disease risks. Um, but I think there's also potential benefits from commercialization there. We, we don't need, you know, 90% of Burke and Albee households to own, own chickens if we can um, have commercial production that reduces the price for, for all consumers. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, are there questions for our speakers? Yes. I'd like to ask Mark Monnery about uh, breast milk. We all know that breast milk is the best uh, food for, for infants. But how about the role of the nutrition of the mother in the quality of the breast milk? We've seen some, um, some data from uh, um, showing that with uh, the levels of breast milk, vitamin B12, for instance, are se severely deficient. Up to 90% of women surveyed are deficient. And uh, so would you care to comment on that? Uh, and certainly, uh, the, a couple of comments here about breast milk. So the quality of breast milk has to do with certainly the mother's nutrition. It's not one-to-one. Some sense the baby is uh, is given a larger share of a, a micronutrient like vitamin B12, but if the mother doesn't have enough, she can't put it in there. She can't make something for nothing. So in a world where where mass is conserved, I wouldn't want us to confuse volume with nutrient content in terms of breast milk um, consumption. So typically, at about six months of age. If you if you breast milk breastfeed as much as, as the baby asks for, you get a package of nutrients. And that package is fixed as you go forth. So that if the baby wants to feed 18 times a day, the mother will have some some dilute the same nutrient package out over the um, uh, the day, you know. So it, it isn't it isn't like breastfeed more, you know, put the kid on the breast more, and that's gonna offer more nutrition. Uh, good morning, my name is Eric. I'm a pediatrician scientist here at UF. I have three questions and I apologize. Um, the first is in terms of the field ability of the mannitol test, um, what is the method of detection that you have in the urine? Does that require a bit test or is it a mass spec to look at the sugar in the urine? So we did detections by HPLC uh, that can be validated by mass spec, but Yes, it, it's important that um, 
uh, I mean, some, some very big projects have gotten into trouble uh, using different detection methods, electrophoretic detection methods, and finding very different answers. Uh, questions two and three are, is there evidence to show that the quantitative immunoglobulins dip in the context of EED? And then the third question is along the spectrum of healthy child to towards the end of the kind of EED spectrum, what are the caloric demands in terms of calories per kg per day in terms of the needs for those children along that spectrum? Excellent question. So in, in terms of absorption, you know, we talk about the gut being damaged and absorbing it. The, the uh, compromise is different for different kinds of nutrients. So to throw out some numbers that, that we can, we can argue with, but, uh, protein absorption is about 15% less. A friend of mine did a stable isotope study that showed for some amino acids is 30% less and some amino acids is 10%. Uh, the, the big players, fat and carbohydrate, tend to be uh, very, very, very well absorbed from our guts. So no, normally, healthy guts will absorb 97% of fat, 95% of carbohydrate. And this just doesn't fall that far down with, with ED. It might fall down to, to 90 or 92% on the fat side. And then there are some micronutrients that are extremely sensitive, it seems like. Uh, zinc, um, for those of you that know anything about zinc, it's it's being excreted into the gut in large quantities by, as it's a cofactor for digestive enzymes. So conservation is very difficult to begin with. And, and this is a very hard one. And your, your first question. A quiz. Um, they, I mean, these children tend to be uh, stimulated quite a bit in their immune system. And they're going to have higher um, circulating immunoglobulin levels, but I don't know what that means. Uh, there's something better about their immune system. Okay, so the next question is for Dr. Gee uh, from Jim Yasmin. The question is, isn't it more, there's two questions. The first question is, is it more relevant to compare costs of ASS versus food grains on a protein basis or another limiting dietary factor such as vitamin B12 rather than calories? The second question is, we know that we are seeing significant rural to urban migration across Africa. How does dietary diversity for women and children change when families migrate and do we see changes in the association between diet and stunting, some of which may be related to better WASH services or WASH services in urban settings. Dr. Gideon, I will unmute you right now. Okay. Okay, thanks. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, on the first question, yeah, I think it was so why, you know, why are we using calories and not other nutrients? Um, so just make sure we don't confuse what's going on here. We're not trying to compare the nutrient content of animal source foods. Of course, we could do that and, you know, the cost of other nutrients. Um, the main point here is that we're arguing that one of the main uh, bases that uh, people use to make decisions, or especially poor people use to make decisions, is uh, calorie content because obviously people feel hunger and you know we have our bodies have um, sort of innate knowledge of calorie deprivation um, and you know there's that's intuitive but there's plenty of evidence that um, people do think a lot about calories and you know that when they um, get richer they start buying more expensive sources of calories and when they get poorer they buy the cheapest sources of calories they can um, and so in really poor countries you can see that most calories come from materials and other starchy staples. So this measure is, you know, the, the, the idea is to explain uh, consumption behavior, not to you know, account for nutrient content. And to some extent, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the, the indicator works well in explaining um, consumption patterns. Um, the second question, um, yeah, in urban areas, things are, you know, always quite a bit better. Stunting rates are lower. Dietary diversity is certainly better. Uh, access to wash services is better. 
Um, we only know a little bit about migration. There is a uh, there's a recent uh, paper in Tanzania where they looked at how diets changed with migration. Although their focus actually was on um, overweight and obesity and sort of you know increasing the uh, consumption of sugary foods, for example, when people move to urban areas. I'll stop there. <laughs>